Jesus Kalekis from MIT, who's also like a co-organizer of the whole uh, of the whole semester, uh, who actually wins for the most exciting title of the workshop. So take it on, Christine. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna be starting this question: What makes a good fisherman? And uh, this is a uh, joint work with uh, Yeswant uh, uh, Terapa Nemjeri uh, from UC Berkeley, Andrew Ilias, uh, who's my student at MIT, and uh, Manolis Nabetakis, who's a postdoc at UC Berkeley and was a student of mine at MIT. Also, this is very recent work. If you, you know, are interested in the details, you can find them here in this tiny URL. The paper will be published uh, in the next few days. Uh, so since I posted this, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, since I published this uh, title uh, for the workshop, uh, there was some Twitter discussion about what makes a good fisherman. Uh, so Gautam Kamath uh, said, I bet you have to understand the Poisson distribution. Uh, to which uh, Clement Canon answered a very deep net. To which Rohan uh, Sukumoran said, or a wide one. Pangun Sung, attention is all you need. So keep the discussion going. Uh, but uh, uh, so here's a statistical approach to understand the answer to the question. Uh, so, you know, how do we figure out what makes a good fisherman? Well, we collect data. So we collect data, x, j, y, j where XJ are the features of some individual, height, weight, speed, training, et cetera. And YJ is the daily catch of that individual day. And, uh, you know, having collected this data and being gung ho about our statistical uh, approach to understanding the world, we fit a model to our data, okay? So that model could be a complex model from some class or uh, just linear regression, like a linear model. And then we look at the features, uh, uh, the coefficients in W and understand what features are important for fishing. So this is great, except uh, it's missing data from all those unrealized uh, fishermen like me. Uh, so, I mean, I, I was trying fishing when I was a kid. I wasn't that good at it, so I, I, I stopped doing it. So uh, the statistician collecting data didn't get my data, and uh, I presume didn't get uh, uh, the data for, from a lot of people in the audience. <laughs> uh, what is the noise here for the fisherman? Excuse me? What is the noise for yeah. the fisherman? Yeah, you have a Gaussian noise for... Uh, you know. Whatever, I mean, that's not the point. Okay? So, <laughs> whatever, no, it's arcade, whatever, doesn't matter. This is not the point. Um, so, point is that uh, when you collected your data, you didn't get all the data that you should have collected because this have been pre selected by decision makers. Okay, so to be more precise, and in fact, that goes back to work of Roy in the 50s who in fact used the just you know, the, the exact same example. He was thinking about a village where uh, people may be either fishermen or hunters. And uh, uh, his uh, mental model was the following, that every person has some features and they try hunting, all right? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna still use Gaussian noise. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes you be you are eaten by the animal, right? So you know, uh, tries hunting. Okay, they get uh, you know they, they they realize that their ability in hunting is something. They try fishing. They realize their ability in fishing is something else, and well, they go with whatever they are good at. Okay, this is what we do. So we try a bunch of things. We choose what we are you know best at. Second uh, individual in that village tried uh, hunting and fishing. This guy was a better uh, fisherman, so they chose to do fishing, and so on and so forth. Uh, so all the village decided what they do. Now, 
If you're going to collect the data on, on, on fishermen, you're only going to see these points. Uh, if you collect the data on, uh, on hunters, you're only going to see those points. And if you try to fit a linear model in these two different sets of data points, uh, you get these two lines, which of course are the wrong lines. So, so the correct lines are those, uh, those two, right? How do you know on all the data? How do you collect all the data? You would have found the right lines, but because uh, those the, the data was filtered by decision makers, uh, you didn't collect the representative data set, and your model is wrong. So that, that is the point of the of the, of the title in the talk. So okay, so let's write down the model. So your fishing income is. Uh, uh, let's say some uh, linear function of your features plus some uh, shock independent of everything. Your hunting income uh, you know, would be, again, a linear function of your features with a different coefficient vector plus some shock, in the, the zero mean uh, independent of everything. And what you do is you select you know, whatever gives you the best income. Okay? So you, you, you choose a profession that is, uh, gives you the maximum income between these two. And you become the profession that gives you the maximum of the two. So the observations that we collect uh, only contain for every person, what's their income and what profession they do, right? We don't collect counterfactuals of what their income would have been had they done some other job. So this is called cell selection. And our goal is to estimate the models and do as well as if we had data uh, for each, all the data, all the even counterfactual data from each profession separately. So, so this uh, type of self-selection bias is very pervasive. Let me, let me show some other examples of it. First of all, I mean, of course, you know, I'm talking about fishermen and hunters, but of course, you can imagine different professions trying to train our algorithmic hiring software based on data that we collected from different professions. Well, guess what? The data we collected are very biased because they do not collect the unrealized, uh, uh, unrealized uh, abilities of people who you know, ended up doing other professions. When we want to train, uh, you know, our you know UC Berkeley software that uh, guides students about their majors. Again, if we just focus separately on different departments, if we fit a model on, on, on the in the math department, and separately fit a model in the in data from the music department, uh, our models are going to be biased in the same way, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can you can imagine this is quite pervasive, because uh, you know many times. Uh, there's some filtering that happens because of people making decisions in what data it gets to be observed. Let me give some other examples so from machine learning. Imitation learning, okay? And I'm gonna talk about imitation learning in this example uh, in the setting of uh, linear contextual bandits. So in linear contextual bandits, in every, on every day, you observe some context, some vector. You're supposed to choose some arm. And uh, in the linear setting, uh, you assume that um, uh, the payoff that you'd get uh, uh, for if you pull arm IT is a linear function of the features of the context plus some noise. All right, so that's linear contextual bandits and you can generalize of course to have other classes there. Again, that's not the point. Uh, so in the imitation learning uh, setting, you want to learn a good policy, not by interacting with the arms yourself, but by observing an expert who is doing the right thing. Okay, so you are a trained, you know, uh, a doctor in training, right? So you, um, uh, you, 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 you just, you know, like you just observe a, 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 a experienced doctor, patients come to the office, the doctor says, okay, let's do treatment uh, IT for that patient. And then another patient comes and so on and so forth. Uh, so you think that uh, the expert chooses the best, okay? So the expert uh, 
sees the context that you see, but maybe the expert also sees some other unobservable things that you don't see. This is the eta t part. The expert does the, the best thing, okay? You're observing the expert in a sequence of rounds, choosing what medicine to give to different uh, patients. <clears throat> so in the end of the horizon, what you have collected is a, uh, a data set uh, that has, uh, uh, which is a sequence of context, which arm the experienced doctor pulled and uh, how well that patient did after that arm was pulled. And you wanna learn uh, the arms. You wanna learn the arms because you know, if you learn the arms, then you become a good doctor, you know what arms to pull in the future. Yes. Uh, maybe I'm going further to the discussion, but in the first example with the fishermen and yeah. uh, what was the other profession? Uh, hunters. The hunters, yeah. So you get two straight lines, but that was wrong in my uh, in my opinion with the following sense. Okay, here let's say that you have the fishermen, and here you do not see any fishermen. So the fishermen are certainly here, so you do not know. Somehow you have tied an information that you get, given that the people in higher kilos, they have, uh, 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 they are hunters, you know. Sure. That, uh, yes, so you can try to exploit that info, but again, the point of that's, okay, so I guess the question is, uh, for those uh, non-realized uh, fishermen, I'm pretty sure they're pretty bad at fishing, right? So you see me, I'm not a fisherman, you say, okay, Costas doesn't so, know how to fish, okay? So, oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, why don't you throw cost that information in the picture? You could. I guess the point of the picture was just doing OLS like we used to, like feeding a model is there is a bad idea. Now you can try to use that information and we'll see in the talk how to use it. Uh, but that, you know, you have to use it. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's example number two. Example number T, selective reporting. I'm just gonna do some examples, okay? Just to, to show uh, the, uh, the various settings where this arises. So, Selective reporting of SAP scores. Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, spice it up a little bit. So, uh, you know, a student with features X uh, takes two tests, two subject tests, subject A, subject B, based on their features, how good they are in different things. They get some score according to some complex model of the two uh, subjects. And then their question is okay, like what subject should I report when I apply for college? Should I give my score for A, my score for B, or both, or whatever? So let's say they're trying to decide between whether to report subject A or subject B. Well, what should they base this decision on? You know, they look at statistics from colleges, right? And, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, they know that, you know, if they report uh, score SA for subject A, uh, this would be their probability of being accepted to college. If they report score B uh, uh, for subject B, this is a probability. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna report whichever of the two, given the realized scores for the two subjects, they're gonna submit whichever one of them uh, maximizes that probability, which you know presumably is an increasing function of the, the score they submit for that subject. So they're gonna do some more complex rule. That's the point of this slide. So they're gonna, they're gonna uh, choose which subject to report based on the argmax of the probability that they get accepted uh, if they submit that score for that subject versus the other one, okay? So whichever one is better and the score they're gonna submit is that one. And again, you know, like you're sitting at the admissions office at UC Berkeley and you're like, okay, like people submitted some submitted score A, some submitted score B. Uh, let's try to learn, uh, you know, counterfactual things, fit those models. We, we cannot do it if you're not careful about it. If you, you cannot be naive about it, that's the point. The point is you cannot be naive about it, right? You cannot just take all, uh, 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 all students submitting score A and fit a model on those and those who submit it for subject B and fit a model on those. You have to mix it up in a careful way, right? From a different part of uh, economics, um, and uh, this is a slightly, uh, slightly different example. Because so, so far, what I've done through my examples, you know, like I had two professions here. You know, I had uh, K treatments over here. I had nonlinear and you know, like uh, non, you know, you know, different selector functions uh, here. 
So for my next example, I'm going to do something a bit different, and uh, in fact, a bit harder. Uh, and that goes back to uh, uh, what is called market disequilibrium studied in economics, uh, uh, where you want to study you know, parts of the market that are not in equilibrium. Okay, so what does that mean? Here's an example. So suppose that uh, for houses with features X, the supply in the market is you know, some linear function of the features. And for uh, the houses with features X, the demand is another line uh, 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 of the feature, uh, another linear function of the features. So in a, in, a, um, in, a, in, a, in a market equilibrium, supply and demand should be equal, okay? But in a market disequilibrium, that's not necessarily the case. So if the supply is harder than the demand, the demand controls how many houses are transacted and vice versa. So the houses transacted are now the minimum of uh, the supply and the demand. Okay, so one change is uh, compared to before is that I had some maxes before, now there's, there's a mean. But more importantly, you don't get to observe which side of the market is tight. You see how many houses with different features got transacted, but you don't know what's the limiting factor. Is it the demand or is it the supply? In this case, all you see is uh, features of houses and how many uh, of the houses with those features transacted, but you don't get to see which side is tight in a market disequilibrium. Again, you wanna figure out uh, uh, what's going on under the sheets, okay? Uh, all right. And I think that's my last example. That's a non-parametric setting. Okay, so again, I gave a bunch of examples with different ingredients just to uh, convey the generality of the thing. So this is an example, uh, a non-parametric example. And this is about estimating uh, auctions, uh, which is again, a classical topic in econometrics. So in an auction, uh, and you know, I'm gonna study auctions, uh, repeated auctions involving the same populations of agents. And I'm gonna assume that the values are independent in every round. So what is called the IPV, independent private value model. So uh, I have a repeated uh, auction involving the same populations of bidders. In every round, each bidder draws a sample from their uh, type distribution, the underlying value distribution for the item that I'm selling. Uh, based on some strategic uh, thinking, they submit a bid to my auction. Now this bid is processed by the rules of the auction and then uh, out comes a winner and what price they're paying. Um, yeah, and this is what I'm writing here. So under some, so people sample values, under some beige NAS equilibrium, they submit their bids. Uh, and uh, uh, you know the rules of the auction determine what happens, and what you get to see is the winner and the price they pay out every round. Uh, in the first price auction, the winner is the maximum of the bids, and the value, the price that they pay, is the maximum of the bids that are submitted. In the second price auction, the winner is the maximum uh, bid, and the uh, price they pay is the second max bid submitted. So. Again, this is an example of uh, selection because uh, there is some data born. Some process uh, decides what to do with them to submit bids. Some other process decides uh, which of them to reveal to you. Again, you get to see a very partial view of the underlying data. And what decides what data you see is some strategic thinking by the bidders and also some optimization that happens at the auction house. Example, we want to learn the values of the, uh... both. So, you may want to learn just the bid distributions or both the bid distributions and the value distributions. And, uh, and what I'm going to uh, talk about, you want to do that in a non parametric way, which is, uh, in fact, it's, it's an open problem with very simple auctions in a kind of like how to learn this non parametric. Okay, so to just summarize what I've talked about so far. Uh, many times we have agents who are fed with data. They do some thinking and out comes some aspect of the data that we get to observe. Uh, in some other cases, uh, we have a lot of agents that are fed data. Each of them <laughs> decides what to do and, uh, with the data and how to interact with other bidders. And out of the whole process comes 
a partial observation of the data that was born in the beginning. Uh, so self-selection, okay, in, uh, if I were to give a, uh, uh, definition is um, a situation where the observed data is not all the underlying data uh, of interest for you know building some model or whatever, but it's the output of some strategic process that has operated on the data on all the data and self has uh, subselected some of the data. So this is self-selection. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I've given you a lot of examples already. Suffice it to say, there are, there's a ton of applications uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the literature of uh, cell selection for all sorts of different uh, uh, topics, uh, participation in the labor force, uh, retirement decisions, returns to education, something that, uh, you know, as academics uh, like tenure choice and the demand for housing, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, auctions and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, here's a textbook that uh, discusses a lot of those applications. Uh, and on the theory side, which is the focus of this talk, um, um, broadly speaking, we, uh, there are asymptotic uh, uh, results or identification results, but uh, in many cases, there are not even identification results. In other cases, there are no efficient estimation algorithms. And uh, uh, this is uh, a very open-ended question, okay? Uh, uh, very fertile for research, and you know, uh, 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 my main goal here is to uh, advertise the existence of these types of uh, problems of learning with bias that comes from decision making that happens in the uh, in the background. And uh, I'm just going to give you some results uh, in this vein, uh, some recent results with my collaborators. Uh, but again, it's a fertile ground for uh, you guys to contribute. And I think it has a big societal uh, value because uh, as I was alluding to uh, with the examples in the beginning of my talk, a lot of, the, uh, a lot of times, uh, if you don't pay attention, you're gonna get biased models leading to biased uh, decisions. All right. Cool. So this is the intro and let's try to do some uh, uh, a deeper dive into a specific setting. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, for most of the talk, I'm gonna study linear models. And I'm gonna study linear models in uh, two cases. One where you observe the index where the maximization takes place and another like the housing disequilibrium, the market disequilibrium example where you do not observe that. So I'll, 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 I'll first, discuss, uh, let's see, so what is the general model that I'm gonna be discussing? So there are some underlying uh, vectors, W1 to WK. These are the ground truth weights. And there's some selection function. The selection function takes a vector of K things and outputs the winner, not the winner, it's not the maximum or whatever. It's like some selection function that says, for this uh, vector values, I prefer index uh, I from one through K. And here's how the data generation process occur, uh, takes place uh, given these uh, uh, fundamentals. So uh, here's the, so the data factor is the following. So you sample a feature vector from some underlying distribution, example features of individuals. Um, for every i, i index, indexes uh, one through k. For every possible profession, let's think about professions, uh, based on the features and the underlying W vector, uh, uh, there is some uh, skill for that individual decided for that particular profession, skill level. And uh, uh, the selection function takes us, is fed all these uh, uh, you know, possible skills for that individual and says, okay, you are gonna be that. Okay, so it selects, a, it selects an index from one through K out of the, K possible professions, okay? So again, K professions, many individuals, each individual samples a feature vector uh, in the background, okay? Understands how well they would be for each of the different professions and based on some rule, maybe the maximum, maybe the minimum, maybe something else, they select what profession to follow. And you get to, to see either the features of the individual, what profession they follow and how good they are at it, uh, and that's called the known index setting. Or you get to only observe uh, uh, the
There's no unknown error to them, or is it? They try, they try their hand in a bunch of things. They see what ETA is. That's, ETA is not noise. It's, it's like uh, some, something that you don't observe. So, right? So, yeah. So they try their hand at different professions and they go with whatever they're good at, right? Yeah. Question. So the left hand side is when you know who the fishmen are and who the are on the right hand side. Yeah. yeah. So here you observe. Uh, features of a person, what profession they do, and their income. Here you only see their features and their income, but you don't see how they got that income. Uh, it, it's uh, interesting. Oh, yeah. Here, yeah. For, for, for the noise, it is completely IID. It is completely IID, so there's, there's not going to be any causal uh, structure or earning of founder. Nothing. Yes, right. correct. Okay. Uh, this is zero, meaning depending on everything. Uh, and for the results, in fact, I'll, I'll put some extra assumptions on it. So. so let's compare to two settings that are maybe more familiar, that we're more familiar with. Okay, again, this is my uh, setting of uh, cell selection. Uh, a well studied setting is called mixtures of linear regressions. The setting is very similar, except what profession you follow does not depend on you know having tried your hand at different professions it's just a random uh it's just a random mixture over like like each individual randomly decides to do uh a profession that's called mixture of linear regressions it's very it's a classical problem as well and has received uh, recent attention so in comparison to that uh, setting when you know the pi's or, uh, yeah. uh, some no, typically you you want to identify them, but 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 even if you know them, it's an interesting question and non-trivial. Uh, in comparison with the setting I'm, I'm starting, though, I want to point out the following. Right, so like uh, in the mixture setting, uh, uh, if uh, the index was revealed, it becomes a trivial problem. So you can just do OLS for different professions because there's no causal mechanism that look like there's no, uh, you know, like there's no, the, what you do does not depend on, you know, how good you are at it. So you can just separate it. Like if you knew the indices or you could guess them or cluster their points or whatever, uh, you could uh, just do uh, OLSs for every profession. Over here, even if I show you the profession of somebody, like who's a fisherman, who's a hunter, you cannot actually, it's not as trivial. It's not trivial to um, uh, uh, estimate the models. Uh, yeah. Oops. Yeah. S is known. Yeah. But but uh, I'm going to get to that. It's interesting to consider. I mean, as I was saying, it's a very fertile ground. Most of the problems are unsolved, and uh, so there are some interesting questions where which profession you follow is uh, depends on the function of your features as well. So there is a different linear model deciding that. So. But yeah, for the model I'm, I'm, I'm starting here, you, you, we assume S is known. All right, so that's one first type of comparison. And I guess underlying this uh, is that uh, over here, the choice of what I star you see is exogenous. It's just a random, randomly sampled. Over here, it's endogenous. It depends on the skills. And this is the, the source of the issue.
here. All right, so again, this is my setting. <laughs> and um, so now, so I'm gonna make an extra assumption, okay? Strong assumption. I'm gonna assume that this is Gaussian. Uh, this is with the same uh, uh, covariance for every profession and it's known. Okay, so we're not going to study settings that we want to, this is unknown. So we, we know it and it's fixed across professions. And we want to estimate the Ws. This is, so we know S, we know uh, sigma. Sigma has a nice uh, parametric uh, distribution. We want to learn the Ws. So this is the problem I would be studying for most of the time today. Very many times. I hope the setting is clear. Yeah, so, all right, so, um, all right, so what do we have? So here's the result that we have. And there's some mild assumptions I'm gonna discuss. With N observations, we can construct uh, estimates of the underlying uh, coefficient vectors uh, so that the maximum L2 error scales like uh, log N over N. Um, now, okay, so this order hides some dependence on underlying uh, parameters of the problem, and I'm going to get to that in a little bit after I state the assumptions themselves, and the running time of the algorithm is also polynomial and everything. Okay, so what are the assumptions that we place? Uh, we assume, so these are the standard assumptions you make, uh, so some of the standard assumptions you tend to make in linear regression itself, okay, so you assume the feature vectors and the weight uh, vectors, the coefficient vectors are bounded in L2. You assume that uh, you have, uh, you know, the empirical covariance is thick enough in all directions, right? So these are standard assumptions that you make in linear regression. Let's, uh, uh, um, yeah, no reason to dwell into them so much. Um, but yeah, so upper bound of the feature vector C on the weights B, and you have this uh, uh, thickness in all directions of the covariance of the of the of the covariance of the feature vectors. All of this relies really very strongly on the independence of the errors, right? So it's a better picture than the other way around. Well, this is break down. Say again. This relies very strongly on the assumption of independent errors. Which which relies. Um, I mean, the identifiability to begin with, but then also the estimation. Uh, everything I'm talking about falls under identical, uh, like uh, independent noise. Yeah. yeah. If, I mean, uh, yeah, if, if, the, if the etas are dependent on each other, then it's a whole different thing. It's kind of what most econometrics has been kind of troubled with, right? But, yeah, self selection. But... Uh, sure. Uh, so, it does not being a uh, zero mean reflects uh, unobserved confounders in econometrics, and it is a big challenge. Uh, over here, the confounding comes from the fact that I don't see all of the data, so there's still there's still like uh, uh, there's still confounding here, right? So uh, you know things are realized, and you only get to observe some of them, so you're still not in. Uh, a nice uh, space. <laughs> yeah. Like I suggest, the other identification result would be that if they put fishermen are exactly the same as the good hunters, that's something you can never reject without the parametric structure, right? If, oh, sorry? If the good fishermen are exactly the same people as the good hunters, yeah. that's a model that's always kind of consistent with the data. It's not part of structure. I, I think it's an interesting question to study situations where you have correlated noise models. We don't, we have not studied that, but it's it's a, it's a next step. Yeah. Uh, all I'm pointing out is that there's still issues with identification here, okay, because of this selection process. So these are two orthogonal directions that you can that you can uh, work with, right? Like, it, like the correlation between ETAs captures the fact that you, there are some unobserved confounders. Okay, so here I'm assuming you observe everything that we need to observe, right? So the rest is you know zero b, but there is this selection bias. So the selection bias uh, is is here very present. Yeah. So first two assumptions are 
pretty far standard. Oh, yeah. What is the meaning of the last one? I understand that it is a covariance matrix there, but what is the intuition that they should have? Uh, let me not go too much into this, but roughly speaking, uh, if you're not taking no directions, then you cannot, like some coefficients uh, of the W vectors are indistinguishable, right? Like, like oh, for example, if you're zero right, and right. in some directions, you cannot tell those, right? So. But these are standards. Um, the uh, uh, second assumption I'm going to make, and that's necessary, is that there isn't a profession out there that is not chosen. Okay, so like if there's some profession that is chosen, you know, zero probability or very close to zero probability. I mean, with zero probability, you're not going to have any data for that profession, so you won't be able to identify the coefficient vector. Uh, but but. You know, and as the probability tends to zero, you have to pay for that in the sum complexity. So uh, what the way we're going to parameterize the problem is to assume that uh, every profession is selected with uh, uh, you know, at least some alpha over k probability for some alpha and we'll parameterize our results with this alpha. K is the number of professions. We'll assume each of them is chosen for probability at least alpha over k. So you want to ban this picture, so where you never become a hunter, uh, and uh, you you want to be in a situation that you tend to see you know all professions in your data. Uh, last assumption has to be go it has to do with the selector function. So in many examples, I was talking about the maximum maximum selector means you know you output uh, y one or y two depending on which one is bigger. Uh, we, we, you know, but we can handle more complex selector functions. You don't have to go with the maximum. So ultimately, what we need is that uh, the slices, the horizontal and the vertical, in any direction, the slices are, are convex. Okay, so uh, for every profession and for every uh, possible skills at that profession, uh, you want that. Uh, if you were to cut, uh, uh, you know, fi fix at some value and, and look at uh, uh, which values of y2 uh, give one as the winner, you want that set to be convex. So you don't want to be in this situation where like this slice here is non-convex, right? So uh, I guess maybe this slice, <laughs> depending on the colors, yeah. Uh, okay, so maximum function that we have been using, uh, uh, you know the uh, you know uh, you know having some fixed monotone functions per profession and choosing the argmax of uh, you know that function the skill all of these conform to this uh, setting. All right. So now to state the result uh, uh, under the discussed assumptions. Uh, yeah, we get uh, errors that uh, you know depend polynomial on these parameters, like the variance of the noise and inverse that, the bound on the weight vectors and the features, the minimum probability and the number of professions and log n over n and the running time polynomial. Yeah. Uh, the data generation can you tell us about yeah. the data generator? Uh, yeah, I did. Let me get to that again. So the data okay. and here the minimum is on the dx. Yeah, so I guess so for this result, you don't need a distributional assumption on x actually. You can uh, get away with just uh, a, a worst case design as long as it satisfies the properties that I mentioned. Yeah, so you don't need parameter uh, distributional assumptions on x, in fact. Uh -huh. This is an expectation or there should be a problem. So in your result, you say that this is less than equal to this. I expect that, yeah, the, the expectation is good, yeah. Okay. Over the x, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't want to talk <laughs> yeah. If you have respect to x, it's not an expectation. But you can't turn it into high probability. Right? Uh, in the assumptions, expectation is better than high probability. But yeah, in, in the, so this is hyperbolic. I mean, you're gonna make it hyperbolic, but in the assumptions, uh, you know, like right. uh, I'm talking about this. This is hyperbolic. Yeah, I mean, there's no delta here, but you can make yeah, yeah you can turn it into the yeah. okay. What would the rate be if there were no self selection? Um, 
uh, you mean like or less stubborn or less? Uh, uh, um, I mean, I guess for stubborn or less, there is not this. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be paying. I mean, uh, you should be paying for one of these two. You have to pay for these two. Yeah, these two are not there. You have to pay for those. Uh, and you know, you don't need to pay for one of those. Right? Uh, you don't need to pay for large bucket or small bucket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask: Do you have intuition for why you have to pay for both? Yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, I'm going to give it out of time, but let, let me give some proof like one over square root and rates. Excuse me. We did one over square root and um, uh, yeah, let's see. Um, I might be missing a square here. Yeah, I might be missing a square there. Yeah. All right. So, what is the approach? Um, well, so um, so you start writing a likelihood function. Okay. So, what is this likelihood? Is a bit weird. Let me try to parse it. Okay. So, you average over all the observations, the end observations that you saw. This mixed bag of people, professions. And their incomes. Um, for a fixed uh, skill, for a fixed feature vector, you pretend you have infinitely many resamplings of that individual for now, and you average those. So you, for a fixed feature vector of that individual, you look at the population, the population of uh, 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 income and profession samples. Uh, for that, uh, you know, feature vector, uh, according to the true model, which you don't have, but you think about this function. And uh, then you look at the log likelihood at uh, a guess of the, of the, at the current guess of the vectors, W1 to WK, the log likelihood of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the log probability of uh, given this uh, feature vector having observed uh, that income and that profession. So you think about this function, okay? Of course, you don't have infinitely many samples from the true model, but you can still think about this function. Uh, so your goal is to show that this function is strongly concave. This is actually what we're gonna show. Uh, it has a unique maximum at the two parameters. Uh, we'll show that it can be computed uh, uh, efficiently, even though we do not have infinitely many samples. And uh, yeah, this, these are the goals. <laughs> All right, so, so, so yeah. We want to do stochastic convex optimization. Correct. That's what we're going to do. But let's try to look at this function for a sec. I mean, okay, I'm not sure you are in the mood for uh, this, but uh, okay, this is the expectation according to conditioning of the feature vector. Again, uh, you know, this expectation stays the same. I'm just reminding you because this is hard to bit opaque what it is. It's just uh, some calculation involving uh, normal random variables. Uh, so, conditioning of the feature vector. To observe this profession with this income, it has to be that this noise uh, vector, uh, you know, satisfies this equation, and also that this quantity dominates all other professions. This is what it is. Is it even for the max? Correct. For this, for 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 you to observe. Uh, 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 oh, you're right. Okay. Yes. So you have to do. Okay. So I'm doing the proof for the max selector. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You can do it for any selector. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that we can. Yeah. Right. No, right. Uh, yes. Um, maybe this is correct. I think. Okay. If you skip this line, this is correct for the general selector function. Uh, so yeah. So you have to sample uh, this value for this profession that that is winning. And 
the other ones must be rejected. So you have to integrate, you know, like uh, uh, you have to integrate uh, Gaussian distribution over some set, which is the slice that gives you I star as the winner. So this is general. This is for the max selector. Sorry about the confusion. But okay, it's not important how it looks like. Okay, but um, let me tell you what is commonly taking place and where the why why it looks like that. So if I take the gradient of this function, so so no matter the details. Okay, so if I take the gradient of the function, it's the difference of two expectations. It's an expectation with respect to the true parameters of some quantity. Let's not write it down. It's going to be complex. Minus, and, and this is illustrates something about the structure of the problem, a mixed expectation that I'm writing here, where you sample a point according to the true model, conditioning of the features, and then you sample the, the remainder from the model at which W, at which you are currently in your gradient descent procedure. So uh, this having this mixed expectation is very common uh, when you try to learn models with latent variables. So in my scenario here, what are the latent variables? The latent variables are, are all those unrealized professions. These are the Y minus I stars of the world. This is me as a fisherman, me as a musician, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these are all the latent uh, values that I could have uh, gotten that you don't get to observe. So uh, we have a, a model with latent variables. Whenever you try to do likelihood in models with latent variables, if you look at the gradient, you have this uh, mixed expectation appearing and uh, also an expectation with respect to the true model. This is quite common. And you know, like models with latent variables are actually pretty hard to solve. Um, yeah, because uh, you know, another way, another thing that commonly happens in, in, in models with latent variables, we have this log integral. So this log integral is, is not good news for, for, for maximum likelihood estimation. Okay. Uh, log integral is not good news. Uh, integral of log is uh, good news, but log of integral isn't. So and variational inference basically tries to change the two. But uh, in our case, surprisingly, uh, the function is actually concave. So, so despite this log integral and this double expectation, this structure that you know uh, arises in latent variable models, it is uh, con concave. Now, uh, coming back to Manolis's remark from earlier, okay, so like here we have a population quantity. Of course, we don't have infinitely samples from the true model. However, for a particular feature vector X, uh, xj, we have seen one sample from the real world. We have seen this, you know, whatever got realized for that particular individual. So with this one sample and plugging in that sample into this expression, we're going to get an unbiased estimate of this term. Uh, now for this mixed term, uh, you know, we do have one sample from this uh, model, uh, which is the true model. And uh, for whatever is inside, we can try to simulate a sample from uh, th this distribution, because you know that is a distribution of parameters uh, W that we know, well, we can just try to simulate and get an unbiased estimate of the whole gradient. So this would be the approach. Uh, let's table that observation for now. So uh, uh, you know the extra things that we show, which I promised earlier, is that the optimum happens at the true parameters, and that uh, and that's a unique optimum because we can show the function is strongly concave. Now coming back to this observation that we can get unbiased estimates. If you have unbiased estimates for the gradient, you can try to do stochastic gradient descent, and the world would be nice if you could do that. Right, so start somewhere in your constraint set, and you know, like, uh, get an unbiased estimate of the gradient. Follow that. If that ever takes you outside of the set, project down to the constraint set and keep going. And you know, because the optimum occurs at the right uh, point, you get it. Okay, so that life would be nice if that was if we could do that. The challenge, though, that arises is that uh, sampling from, from this uh, uh, distribution is actually not uh, clear how to do. Uh, so, because, uh, uh, you know, like, um, 
this profession and this income for this individual was realized under the true parameters. And that might be a very unlikely uh, scenario for the parameters W, where we try to sample from this uh, conditional uh, distribution, giving I star as the winner with income Y I star. So because gradient descent will wander far in, you know, in, in our constraint set, uh, you know, just doing rejection sampling uh, to sample from this conditional and normal or distribution is not actually, uh, it, might, it might take exponential time. And what we do in the paper is we do uh, uh, Langevin dynamics to, 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 to solve this issue. Uh, and uh, let me, uh, basically the whole thing boils down to the following situation. You need a sample from some Gaussian center that some U uh, constrained on a uh, conditional on some set L. And that L may have a very low probability under your Gaussian that you want to uh, sample. What you know, it has big uh, probability under some other Gaussian with mean new star. So you have a set L that has high, reasonably high probability under new star. But uh, um, you and new star are some distance away from each other, which may make your set have exponentially small probability under new. So you cannot just do rejection sampling uh, from new to get a, a, a sample in, in that uh, condition on, uh, lying in the set. So uh, what we show is you can do uh, Langevin dynamics to actually do that in polynomial time. Okay, so this is what we use. Uh, details, I guess, uh, don't matter at this uh, late time. Uh, some directions for this part of the talk. Uh, it'd be nice to have uh, more complex uh, uh, noise variance models, uh, potentially uh, correlated uh, 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 among you know, uh, uh, different uh, professions. Um, more complex uh, selection mechanisms. Uh, there was a question earlier by me, I believe, uh, where uh, the selection itself is not known, but you also have to estimate it. And of course, uh, doing more uh, complex uh, 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 models, estimating more complex models. Yes. So uh, maybe if I cover this, I'm not sure. Let's say that I um, sample with non-zero probability all the professions, good probability. So uh, they could, yeah. right? Yeah. But my selection is that never choose uh, it ne among all these professions. It never chooses the first. So it takes the max of the other ones. Correct. It never chooses this one. Yeah. You never get to an, an unbiased estimator of this one. Correct. So how can, does it? Uh, yeah, so one of my assumptions was that under W star, you sample each profession with decent probability, right? Like right. So I'm sampling, Excuse me? I'm sampling with decent probability all professions. My selection process is. Uh, no, but uh, it was a, it was a, it was about the same, like this requirement uh -huh. was about, I mean, there's no sampling of profession that you try your hand in every profession and then the selector function tells you which one to choose. Right. Like that selector function always uh, disregards one of the professions, there's okay. no hope. Okay. Uh, what I assumed is that this selector uh -huh. uh, with respect to all the probability in the system selects this profession uh -huh. and this is probability. I mean, yeah. uh, can you actually go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, I don't see the, the, the result that you have. Okay. Yes. 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 So uh, my question here, uh, uh, so of course, yes, with Langevin, you can uh, you can get uh, a polynomial uh, polynomial dependence on the dimension, but uh, you cannot. You it's going to be biased. Uh, no, I don't, I don't want to say that. Okay. Uh, uh, this is not something that you can actually run because this is a continuous time problem. So you have to discredit. Oh, this is not a Monte Carlo. Uh, it's thick plus one. It's discrete time. It's not. Okay. Uh, it's not the Monte algorithm. Not. Uh, okay. Dynamics. Okay. 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 Fine. Yeah. Fine. 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 Okay. Okay. Sure. Yes, you can. This is not the Okay. Okay. And it gives you some bias because not really sample from the intelligence yeah, division, but fine. you can okay. split that into the stochastic gradient descent analysis. All right. So. Interesting directions all around. Uh, some of them already raised uh, 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 by questions and stuff. So let me try to wrap up. So we have some results for the unknown index setting. Okay, so 
Uh, I'm reminding you that in the Arnold index setting, you don't get to, you get to see the features of a person in their profession, but not uh, how they make that money. Uh, and, you know, already compared to mixtures where kind of like if you saw the profession, that would be trivial. Uh, uh, and, and sort of like uh, the where it's exogenous which profession they do. Over here, I have endogeneity and non trivial, uh, even when I, uh, I do see the profession. So, um, and the point here is that uh, the concavity of the log likelihood is uh, out of the picture. So, you don't have a log concave likelihood in this uh, latent variable model. And in fact, identifiability is not even obvious in this setting. Uh, so in our work, we resolve uh, some of the issues uh, here. So we, uh, under uh, some more stronger assumptions, right? So like assuming uh, a distribution on the X's, uh, assuming, uh, and, and doing only the max selector. So under, under these two assumptions, uh, we can extend, we can show identifiability, and we can get uh, efficient algorithms uh, um, for certain things. So let me summarize here. So we can get identifiability uh, uh, for every K. Uh, for every K, uh, we can uh, efficiently identify the span of the, of the feature of the coefficient vectors. Uh, and for K equals two, we can get everything to be efficient. For general K, we don't know the answer to that yet, okay? So this is, Basically, what I wanted to talk about, uh, coming back to uh, my uh, this slide here, um, in many cases, and I, and I hope I, I showed you, uh, you know, so several examples in the beginning, right? So the data that you get to observe to do your statistical analysis has been filtered through a process involving decisions uh, uh, made by people and so other strategic uh, phenomena. And uh, you cannot just blindly trust that data to you do your uh, statistical analysis. And, you know, uh, I showed you some results for efficient estimation when you observe the index uh, and uh, some identification results uh, I didn't get, which I didn't get to for uh, unknown index. And again, the, the future is uh, open with uh, several uh, interesting directions to uh, push you. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bastis. So we're opening the floor for uh, questions. Yeah, so I wanted to go back to the sigma question because I found it interesting that you paid one over sigma. Oh, yeah. I didn't because, address that. Yeah. Um, because yeah. you know, you would imagine that less noise would be helpful. Is the issue that? Um, so, so, so you need. Is some... it because you're trying to learn the weights themselves? So you, I guess it boils down to, uh, you know, yeah. So the question is about sigma. Uh, I don't know where that slide is, but I guess what guarantee do you have? You have a guarantee that. Uh, the set has this in mass under this new star. And you have some constraint on the distance between new and new star. As the sigma gets smaller, uh, you know, it gets even harder for like things that are far away to, uh, right? So there is some like, right? So it becomes rarer to, to get that set. But does the problem get, like if you just tried to learn a map from X to the profession, Maybe you could do that if sigma is very Yes, small. I mean, it's a limiting, I mean, this one, like this uh, sigma one over sigma is a feature of our approach, is a, it, it, but it is not necessary. I mean, often in linear regression, having small, like in linear regressions, having small sigma is good for you. Right. Right? <laughs> yeah, as we discussed earlier in the talk, yeah. We don't, it's a, you know, we, we're using Langevin for this uh, specific thing and we need to pay this one over sigma. So one over sigma is because of Lanzibana, otherwise it will not yeah. have the problem. Yeah. So you may have covered this and perhaps I missed it. I was wondering if it's possible to do some kind of survey of the population, like in some settings, maybe you know how good the average person is at fishing or at 
hunting. Maybe you just have some surveys or something. Is that something that uh, to bypass the whole complexity or like to help with assessing the what the information um, filter? Yeah, I mean, if you right, if you had if you had access to this kind of factuals, first of all, uh, you can break it up by profession and uh, problem solve. But maybe like there is an intermediate model where I don't know. Maybe you have some so noisier noisier understanding of the unrealized samples and right like you yes. don't see for the samples that you get you don't see exactly the scores for those ones you just know something about the population. yeah so these are all fertile this is all fertile ground for for, for, for investigation yeah have you thought about uh, bandits or other kinds of partial feedback in this setting so this is one kind of partial feedback or uh, like partial data um, I feel like bandits, this uh, kind of selection happens after, like you select and then you observe the wise, whereas here you first get wise and then you get, you select. So I'm not sure if, if you've thought about that. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, um, you know, I guess in bandits you have an, adver I mean, you, you, you select, I mean, it. Uh, Related to bandits, one interesting direction is doing soft max type of selection, uh, right? So you like Im imagine you're observing a doctor who's doing uh, XP3 or whatever, uh, and uh, so the selection uh, that they're using is uh, not just max; it's a softer version of max. Uh, maybe it's you know randomized as well. Uh, so it's it's interesting to consider things like that there. Now, to model the adversary, I haven't thought about it from this lens. I feel like, I mean, the adversary has, I mean, I, yeah, I haven't thought about it from this perspective, yeah. Uh, so uh, I have a question uh, regarding the known versus unknown in the index setting. So it seems that the uh, the means being, being closed together is beneficial in the known in index setting, but might be not beneficial in the Unknown is because you wouldn't be able to distinguish between the professions, right? So, is there any extra assumptions you need to do? Um, the, the, you're right. Uh, we, like, for example, like, you know, like, I mean, this is effectively under the, it's a, it's a profession is selected. Uh, I mean, you, uh, yeah, so so, so that, that 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 is swept under some assumption of this form that uh, uh, you get to see every profession uh, with decent probability. But but, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. So it will. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Some yeah. Some collinearity has to be avoided in, in that. Some I think some extra you have to so place. Specific, yeah. You have to specifically for the linear. But yeah, I, I guess my question was specifically for the linear model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you, uh, you, you we, we throw in an extra assumption for the, you know, together with this, you know, it's profession chosen at least uh, with fraction ever K, we also want to avoid some, uh, yeah, collinearities and stuff. But I mean, you know, like, I mean, philosophically, you, you could think like, you know, like two Ws are the same, like, is it the same profession or different? I mean, it depends on exactly what you want to achieve. But, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks. This is very interesting. So, related to the like one over sigma question. Yeah. So, what goes wrong if sigma is zero? What goes wrong if sigma is zero? Like, can you uh, solve this problem using another approach? Maybe? Oh, uh, you mean like in the not in the approach, but in uh, the general setting? Yeah, I think like if You're... sigma is zero in the general setting, this would be an easy case, right? Because you see part of the line like this, part of the line like that, everything is collinear, you learn it. So no problem. problem yeah, solved. but for this approach, yeah. it gets difficult. Correct. Because again, this is a technical uh, issue that uh, arises with Langevin, right? So like, I don't know the limit as sigma goes to zero, but I know at sigma equals zero, it's a trivial problem. So, uh, you know, as I'm getting there, uh, you know, I expect it shouldn't be a hard problem. But it's just that it's like you know this approach. So presumably, if sigma is too small, you are not. You should not use this. Correct. Approach. Correct. You could do maybe other things like. Yeah. Um, we didn't really focus so much on that, to be honest. 